TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Don't forget we are partnered with the Blueprint Mastermind, man. We do sit down. We sit down once a week, but <clears throat> all the episodes are just now dropping. But we sit down once a week, you know, talk about the round table and whatnot. Talk about it. Talk about it. Um, that link's down in the description, man. Go like, sub, subscribe, turn up. Um, he made TV appeals knowing full well what he done. I have no clue what this is about, but this is on Socially Criminal, and I love their channel. Y'all know I love their channel. Oh, man, I get documentaries every single day if I want to. Whoever created this channel, I love you. Literally, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Let's get into this. I ain't even read the description. It's so blind. Reacts. This time. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Forgot. <laughs> You too, please. <laughs> Thank you. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal to Anna. When a mum and her daughter are declared missing, her husband breaks down in public. He spent two months not even bothering to contact the police and yet had no, such no, no. terrible This and late suspect is in the pretty anyone let's just get to the documentary Melbourne no spoilers. on Australia's south coast 40 miles from the center stands the sun-drenched suburb of Mornington this is Australia Austria Australia Mornington's a little bit piece of paradise by the sea it's idyllic that really belied what had happened there it was a shock to the neighbours and it was a shock to a local community that such horror had happened in their own streets. At the centre of that horror, 41-year-old Anna Kemp, devoted mother of a 20-month-old daughter and with another baby on the way. OK, OK. A 20-year-old, I mean, a 2-year-old, basically. I got a 22-month-old. 20, it's a two-year-old, and one on the way, she's pregnant, okay. That Anna was gregarious, charismatic. I remember the her being described as she'd fill up a room when she arrived. Um, she had a very outgoing personality and was, was really popular among her friends, her colleagues, which really drew, drew a sharp contrast to her husband, who was withdrawn. Uh, isolated and really had trouble making friends um, both at work and in, the, in his wider community. Anna from New Zealand had married John Sharp in 1994 after meeting him at the Melbourne Bank where they both worked. At 27, he was four years her junior. John Sharp was described as a quiet man, a shy man. This is why I don't mess with co-workers. Now, another way of looking at this was that he was actually quite socially inept. He didn't have much in the way of communication skills. He didn't have a lot of emotional intelligence. They'd had a whirlwind romance, but Anna had told people that she thought that maybe she'd made a mistake. She hadn't chosen the right husband, but nevertheless, she was committed. She was going to stay and she was gonna try and make this work. It was soon after marrying that the couple moved to Mornington. After eight years together, their daughter Gracie was born. When Gracie came along, there was extra pressure put on the couple because... Eight years together, so she, they met 31 and 27. Okay. She was born with hip dysplasia and she had terrible trouble sleeping, terrible trouble eating. So she needed an awful lot of care. I was just gonna say, that's like a geriatric, geriatric pregnancy when you, I think it's past 33. It's not nothing negative I'm saying, these are facts. It's like, it's like it's like like past 33 for women. It's a geriatric pregnant, which uh, complications could come. I was that's what I was thinking. That's why I did that math. But Anna had always wanted to have another baby, 
And when she became pregnant again, she didn't get the response from her husband that she'd expected. He shouted at her. He said he absolutely didn't want to have another child. He didn't even try and disguise the fact that he was feeling very, very hostile towards Anna. In March 2004, Sharp called Anna's mother in New Zealand. Claiming she'd left him for another man, despite being Anna's mother in New Zealand. Claiming she'd left him for another man, despite being four months pregnant. Other members of her family then began receiving letters and emails, supposedly from Anna, all of them confirming what her husband had said. Anna's family was suspicious right from the start because it just did not fit at all with her personality or her circumstances. She was a very loyal partner, was about to have her second child, and it just did not fit at all that she... Oh, we know where this is going right off the bat. ...he would run off with another man. Once Melbourne police were alerted, they established that Anna and Gracie hadn't been seen in public for two months. Unconvinced by Sharp's claims that his wife had simply walked out on him, they launched a missing persons investigation. Police say a search of the family home found nothing untoward. They say some of Miss Kemp's clothing was missing, but other items that her daughter would use hadn't been taken. Sharp himself said nothing, until reporters tracked him down several days later. I remember at the time watching it watching him on the television and I turned to my husband and said, I reckon he did it. I reckon he's guilty. I just want to ask um, Anna or anyone that knows. Is this actual footage right here? I reckon he's guilty. I just want to ask um, Anna or anyone that knows where she is or just anything about just my daughter. And I've since spoken. If that's actual footage, that is a terrible liar. That is that. Ma'am, you are right. To other people who also said they had that reaction. There was just something about him. It just seemed quite obvious that he wasn't being truthful. But what was that something? I just want to ask um, Anna or anyone. Just these eyes, they everywhere. That knows where she is or just anything about just my daughter. So this is a very, very poor attempt at portraying concern and sadness. And therefore, we've got to doubt the integrity of this message. That's a fact. I've watched a many, many of these, and that was probably top two and not number two worst lies I've ever seen in my life while doing this. That was terrible. First, we get this prolonged eye blink. It's a good part of a second, half a second, just a little bit more. Way too long. And this is a, a distancing signal that whatever I'm saying right now, I'm not connecting with. And then he moves into some squirming with his brows, where he's got one brow coming down. You look at the, his left brow is pointing up in the middle, almost like sadness. Hey, don't none of y'all start taking this body language experts expertise and start trying to apply it in real life. You are not him. You did not go to school. You are not a professional. Leave your cheating girlfriend alone trying to figure out if she cheating or not. Stop it. And then on his right, we've got the other brow going up. So we've got this little um, juggling going on between his brows, which is highly unusual. Liar. And he's squirming and trying to form his upper face probably into a sad pose. And then when we look at the face overall, the squirming is accompanied, not just in the eyes, but in the mouth, where we get the mouth raising and almost like a, uh, a moving up of the lips into a growl. Now, normally that would signify anger or disgust, but that's not supported by the eyebrows. 
So he's, he's making contortions of muscles on his face to try and portray some form of concern, and it's not working. At all. Bro mouth don't support his eyebrows. That's what I'm really worried about, my daughter. If I could just come forward and even if you don't ring me, just the media or police or her family. One of the things that John Sharp says um, is... Family. Even if you don't ring me, just the media or police or her family. Or her family? Aren't you her family? Wait, OK. One of the things that John Sharp says um, is to communicate to us that he's really worried about his daughter and we should pay attention to how he does this. There's audible breathing, so to Wait, who are you? To from the chest, all of which right, uh, from stress. There's wisdom. audible breathing, so he is because this. To oh, us, that he's really worried about his daughter, and we should pay attention to how he does this. There's I'm audible breathing, so he is breathing from the chest, all of which suggests extreme stress. If you like, he's in an arousal state. This is flight, uh, fright, or freeze. Professional. Pro professor of Linguistics. Um, and unfortunately for him, he's in front of a camera and we're picking all of this up. And what we see at this point is that he's singling out his daughter for a reason. That's what I'm really worried about, my daughter. Why is he not saying I'm really worried about my daughter and my wife? So the narrative here seems to be that she's just gone somewhere not that something sinister has happened to her. In which case, why is he worried about his daughter then? With the police unable to find any trace of Anna or Gracie, suspicion increasingly fell on Sharp himself. He denied involvement, but his public behavior only fueled the rumors. He spent two months not even bothering to contact the police and yet had suddenly become a crumbling shell of a man who was trembling. He felt that, that something was enough. highly, highly wrong. His behaviour is a big red flag. In fact, it's a big red flag flapping in a very strong breeze because he's a terrible, terrible actor. He seriously overestimated his ability. But y'all also said he's not emotionally adequate too, so... He just probably could just, you know, I don't know. Let's... To pull this one off. I'm speaking today to make a national appeal to Anna. May 2004. Two months after his pregnant wife and baby daughter were seen in public, John Sharp faced the cameras again in a doorstep press conference at his parents' home. Our marriage may be over, but I still love you. As you are the mother of our beautiful daughter, Gracie, whom we both adore more than anyone else. His claim that Anna had left him for another man had been met with skepticism by the police and public. Just straight off the fact that, let me put your, like, think about it. Like, just really sit there and think about it before I say what I'm about to say. You got a two month, you got a two year old and one on the way. What other man want? Who? This is so unbelievable. <laughs> and despite his protests of innocence, the questions wouldn't go away. Did you kill your wife, Anna? I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. So we have 14 words within five seconds with multiple indicators of deception. First, we get a prop being used here of a tissue. Uh, there's no moisture under his nose. Uh, there's no tears on his face. He then brings us this pained expression on his brows to try and show concern, which doesn't fool any of us. His mouth is raised upwards, and he says, I haven't harmed either of them. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. So if we focus in on the language, we have repetition. It's telling us I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. Why does he have to tell us that in various ways? 
this is him trying too hard to convince us. It's significant, though, that he's not using their names at this point. So we've got an element of distancing. I haven't harmed my wife or my daughter. I haven't harmed either of them. And then he keeps shaking in his head. I've never heard about this case. Head beyond the words. And this is called a convinced tactic. So when you shake your head back and forward and say, I haven't done it, that's OK. But if you say, I haven't harmed any of them, but you prolong that into multiple shakes, that is characteristic of mm. deception because people do that to convince you that it's true. Whereas if it was true, you just say it. You just convey the message. I've not harmed them. No, I've not harmed them. It's a convincing tactic that we rarely see with true tellers. And it's like to, like to play with your subconscious, I guess, right? Because you remember him saying it, then he was for 20 minutes afterwards. For all the time Anna was missing, there were indications that she might be alive. Her ATM card had been used to make cash withdrawals. Her mother had received flowers, supposedly bought by Anna, on her birthday. Other family members had also been sent emails from her account. But detectives were increasingly convinced it was all a charade. Yeah, we was, don't know the source was, of if it was, he was going deep for this. those emails. Uh, as I say, they purport to come from Anna. We're very sceptical about that. In eight degree water, police divers search for evidence in an effort to uncover the whereabouts of Anna Kemp and her daughter Gracie. Fifteen SES volunteers were also on hand for the three hour operation under the supervision of the homicide squad. But even as the operation turned into a murder investigation, Sharp insisted Anna had been in contact. He stuck to the story he gave in his earlier TV interview that she'd walked out, returned a few days later to collect Gracie, then taken a taxi to join her new man in a waterside district of Melbourne. As far as I know, she's still still in somewhere like in Chelsea. She's told me that she's in Chelsea, in Chelsea area. <laughs> Every clip they show, it get worse and worse of him lying. Was that a fake stutter? Like a fake concerned stutter? Like, I can't even get the words out? Like, what is it? Come on, so she's around and she's been in touch. And at the start of this, I'm partially convinced that he's moving into a, a sad state because he's finally got his brows together. And in this image, you can see they're asymmetrical. So that's a little bit, his, his right brow is higher than his left brow, but they're starting to form into a sad expression. But it doesn't evolve into an emotional state. The asymmetrical pose gets more asymmetrical as he goes through the session. So he's posing sadness with his brows. We get nothing from the lower part of the face that's reinforcing any sad state. And so we know this is a pose. As far as I know, she's still, still in Chelsea, somewhere like in Chelsea. Where's she's the linguistics? In, in Chelsea area. Where's the professor of linguistics at? I'm ready. <laughs> so first thing we notice is how many times he's trying to tell us the same thing. The second thing is his volume drops and he is struggling to get out the words. I mean, it, it feels painful to watch him get his words out. As far as I know, she's still, still in somewhere like in Chelsea, she's talking about Chelsea. And it's happening when he's trying to get the word Chelsea out. He is really, really struggling at this point. His volume drop suggests he does not have any confidence in what he's saying. Neither did the police. When they checked Sharp's stool... Is it just me or as, as she's... As she's breaking it down, like, I'm, like, trying to replay a lie that I've told in my head. And I'm like, dang, she right. I show when I was capping, I did not have confidence in that cap. That's tough. Dang. Hey, if you're a first responder and you hear in the live, remember, y'all likes matter. Everybody likes matter, but the first responders, the first people that watch it, y'all set the tone. So hit that like button for me. Thank you. Story that Anna had left. Neither did the police. When they checked Sharp's story that Anna had left their home in a taxi, 
they found that no local cab driver had accepted a fare from that address. At the same time, they put their suspect under surveillance. They were tracking his every move. At one point, he tried to throw out some of the, some of the items from his house. They were retrieved by police. They also found Enna's ATM card that was stashed in next to a public toilet block, which he was retrieving and then using it at, uh, at ATMs to, to maintain a pretense that Enna was still alive. They also observed him visit um, rubbish bins where he had dumped some of Anna's... Rubbish. OK. OK, so I thought rubbish was just like a word that y'all call, which it is. I thought it was like a, like a, just like a, like a, you know, sending them for trash. But I didn't know y'all was posting it, putting it on garbage just like this. I thought I thought that was a trash can, but that's a rubbish can. Okay. Belongings um, and also some notes that he'd made. So they allowed him to trip himself up. And then when, when they went in hard and interviewed him, it did not take too long for him to fold because he knew the game was up. Detectives had guessed correctly that Sharp had killed Anna and Gracie then tried to pretend they were alive afterwards. But none were prepared for the horrific story he was about to tell them. A story that began with him visiting a fishing tackle store months earlier. Wait, we about to get the full story? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Gatorade for this. Earlier. John Sharp had purchased a spear gun at a fishing shop. He'd actually practiced how to use it. And the night that he decided, this is it, I'm going to do this, Anna had gone to bed. He crawled up the stairs, went into the bedroom with the spear gun, shot her in the head, and unfortunately was unable to kill her the first time. So he then had to shoot her again. Throughout the whole episode, no, not like that. Episode, 20-month-old Gracie lay asleep in her bed. But Sharp had already decided that she too had to die. Three days later, he went to buy more ammunition for the spear gun. He takes Gracie, he actually carries her in his arms to the sports shop where he buys another spearhead that he plans to use to kill her. Now, we're not... Honestly, this just went from gruesome to gruesomely sick. This is sick. Talking about somebody who's overflowing with empathy here, but believe it or not, we're not talking about an out-and-out -out psychopath either. I don't believe This you. is a man who has made a decision to kill his daughter because he feels that's the best way to cover up the murder of his wife. So he's had to go through a process of justifying that in his own head. He's had to overcome any qualms that he might have about this utterly despicable behaviour. And he says something to police later on, which I think is very telling, and I think tells us about what he has said to himself. He says he believes that children are better off with their mothers. Now, mothers do have a nurturing thing about them, which children are really bonded to. But that, the way he formed it is weird. It's kind of like, I can't even think of that. Say, like, Sharp dude. shot Gracie with the gun four times. He then dumped her at a municipal tip along with Anna's dismembered body parts. Oh, 
Sharp shot Gracie with the gun four times. He then dumped her at a municipal tip along with Anna's dismembered body parts. Oh my God. It took a police team three weeks to comb through the refuse and find them. 17 years on, this crime is every bit as ghastly as it was the day it happened. There's no real moving on for anybody involved in the case. Four times? Like... For Anna's family, for the police who searched a tip to find the remains of, the, of, a, of a mother and her daughter, you know, they, they, are, they are simply scars and trauma that remain forever. For Anna's friends who had their friend's life snuffed out, uh, and they've also got to live with knowing what happened to her, and it's, it is an unspeakable cruelty committed by the hands of a father. It's disgusting. In 2005, Sharp was convicted of both murders and jailed for life with a minimum of 33 years. I just, it's, I just hate hearing with a minimum. What happened to life without parole? Like that, th this is very deserving. If he was in Texas, y'all know what's up. A psychiatrist said he was a dependent and passive man who believed killing Anna and Gracie was the only way to end what he saw as irresolvable difficulties in his family life. He says that he chose to kill Anna because he was unhappy with their marriage, he was unhappy at the prospect of having another child, and he felt that she was bossy and controlling. Well, a much more Divorce. appropriate way to reframe this is actually not to look at her behavior at all, but to say that he was a dissatisfied, a resentful and hugely, hugely inadequate man. And rather than confront his problems head on, he decided that he was going to take control of this situation and change things for himself using the most extreme form of violence imaginable. He's a coward, he really is. He's quite pitiful. There's I can't even hold you, Gangi. I, I agree, ma'am. I agree 100% with every word that you just uttered. No excuse, and there can be no excuse and no justification for what he's chosen to do. There's none. May the 26th, 2018 and police mount an urgent search for a 29-year-old woman. Three. Are there two stories of this? Hours earlier, Christina Abbott had missed a long-awaited get-together, leading her family to fear the worst. Christina was due to celebrate her birthday, and her friends had arranged a party for her uh, at Sarah Denali QC, Crown Prosecution. Okay, so this is UK. Uh, a bar uh, awesome. in London. When she failed to turn up, everyone became concerned because it's totally out of character. She was quite a party girl and she certainly wouldn't have missed her own birthday. Christina had recently started house sitting at a friend's flat in Crawley, West Sussex. <laughs> at 2.20 a.m., Officers forced their way inside. There, they found her battered and blood-stained body in the bedroom. But she wasn't alone. Yeah, there's, there's someone else in here. Oh. Hang on, his eyes, are, his eyes are flickering. In an adjoining room, and apparently unconscious, a middle-aged man wearing only a dressing gown. Hello? Hello? He's half naked and he's locked in a flat from the inside that doesn't belong to him and Christina's body is in the bedroom next door. So he's got some pretty big explaining to do, hasn't he? An understatement. When you feel threatened, you go into fight or flight. Forensic psychologist. 
fight mode. So you either fight or you run away. And then the third thing to do is to play dead. Come on, mate, you can hear me. Wakey, wakey! I don't know who he thinks he's fooling. I'm sorry. Okay here because very clearly the paramedics are not buying his act and they've seen this a million times before Tell me you can hear me i know you can hear me so it's a pretty pathetic strategy and i don't know whether that's because he is desperate or whether he's arrogant maybe it's a bit of both the man was Zahid Nassim, a 47-year-old father of two who lived 60 miles away in Buckinghamshire. He was determined to continue with his act, both in an ambulance and at hospital. Because of the circumstances leading to you being here at the hospital, OK, you are at this time under arrest on suspicion of murder, OK? But while he lay silent, there were more signs that he knew exactly what was happening. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm his defense if you do not mention when questioned something which... So he's had his rights read to him, and we get a little bit of blinking from the eyes. He's shocked. Bro, shocked that that didn't work. And he's just pretending to be slightly out of it to give him that space and uh, that distance from this difficult situation. That seems to be giving him a, a calm state. And if we look at the monitor in the room, his heart rate is at 76. So he's not panicking. He's quite comfortable that he's safe as long as he pretends to be half asleep or unconscious. But he's not fooling anyone here. With their suspect unable or unwilling to talk, police began sweeping the flat for clues. It was seen as though a party had been taken place, the aftermath of a party, with bottles, uh, evidence uh, of drug use, and the place in a, in a general uh, state of disarray. In the bathroom, a knife was found, uh, together with um, droplets of bloody water. I say bloody water, not blood itself, but it certainly um, gave the appearance that someone had been either trying to wash blood off themselves or wash blood from the bathroom itself. Near Christina's body, police also found the murder weapon, a kitchen pestle which the killer had used to beat her over... Ain't that what you grind pepper with? ...the head. But if that killer was Nassim, what was his motive? And why was he in the flat in the first place? The police very quickly found out that Christina, far from working in IT, as she told her family and her friends, was actually in prostitution. She advertised her services under the name Tilly Pexton on an adult site that was home to what you might call high-class escorts. Her route into prostitution was a bit of a mystery because she'd studied business at university and she'd worked as a travel agent. But there she... she studied business and she worked at a travel agency. So working at a travel agency, oh, all right, I'm not going to put it together. If y'all can't, I won't. She was advertising herself as an educated city girl with the face of an angel at three and a half thousand pounds per night. Nassim was a repeat client. Before Christina's death, He'd hired her three times, meeting up in luxury hotels and restaurants. The bills were expensive, but he could afford them. Zahid Nassim worked in the banking industry as a contractor in the risk management area of the business and was earning a good salary. Uh, on his own reports, uh, he could earn up to £250,000 a year. He might have been seen as a stereotypical client uh, for an escort girl. He had uh, been estranged from his wife. And what is clear is he turned to um, sex workers to perhaps fill that, that void. He had the disposable income uh, to be able to fund that double life that he was leading, uh, to indulge in escort girls, drugs, and alcohol. Oh, 
That part of this is so common. It's so common, man. If I wasn't on probation with YouTube, I would explain it, but I'm, I am, so. What's that with it? It's like, how, how, is, how is this coming Oh, maybe when I'm, when I'm in the live. Remind me tomorrow when, when this comes out in the live. If I'm in here, I will. Oh, I, no idea. Girl, no girl. idea. Wait, what? Drugs and alcohol. Help us out with it. So like, how, how, is, how is this come about? I have no idea. I have no idea. Detectives now knew why he was at the flat. But when they interviewed him later that same day, he had no explanation for why Christina was dead. Okay. Did you actually phone anybody at all? I can't remember. Is that uh, you can't remember, but you possibly may have done? I don't know. I can't remember. And if you did... There are several language-based indicators. If he's so rich, where is his lawyer? ...indicators of interest throughout the interview to tell you that he's really struggling. One is the fact that um, there are a significant number of long pauses throughout. Um, sometimes that is that he's either unsure of what to say and or he's thinking about what to say next. Did you at any time think to call for help? I did. Tell, tell me about that. I did and I was just, well, what the hell happens next? So did you think about calling for help? And he says, I did. But what he does simultaneously is move his head backwards and forwards with a no gesture. I did. So when he says I did, which is affirmative, but his body here is saying, no, I didn't. We can trust the body when it contradicts the words because the words are easy to manipulate, but micro gestures like this, below consciousness of the individual, leak the truth. It gets that deep? Did it not cross your mind that they, you know, ambulance may have been able to assist her or? I don't think she was alone. Right, okay. And um, without putting words, did you not panic and think, I need to phone the police? Something's obviously happened. So the reaction we get from Nazim at this point is almost like an escape. I did, but I just I don't know. I just don't know. I just couldn't see what was going to happen that was going to change anything. So it's almost like someone on the starting blocks. He raises his bottom off the chair, he switches it around almost 90 degrees to the officers, and his head's down, ready to bolt out of that place. So it almost seems like a subconscious decision of, I need to get out of here because I, I can't face these questions because I don't have an answer. So the movement round into that escape gesture has got to be suppressed because he's not allowed to run out of an interview. For the remainder of questioning, Nassim insisted he had no idea what caused Christina's death, but he could only play for time for so long. Police had ordered forensic tests on the murder weapon, and his DNA was on it. The killer had made... Broden played, he played sleep. Left DNA, like, what do you do? This at this point, you might as well tell the truth. You're caught, buddy. You know where you're going? The jail. 13 blows to the back of Christina's 13. head with the pestle. This is an expression of anger. Not only that, but a desire to kill Christina and punish her at the same time. The day after police arrested Zahid Nassim for Christina Abbott's murder, they were able to trace his movements on the night she died. CCTV showed he'd gone to a supermarket with her to buy champagne. He'd also withdrawn 200 pounds from a cash machine to pay for a cocaine delivery to her flat, a normal weeknight for the wealthy and outwardly respectable city banker. By his own admission, Nassim was addicted to both sex and drugs. He took cocaine regularly, and also he would seek out sex at swingers' parties, and he would regularly... 
Yeah, Nassim was a part of that life. He was, he was really wildin'. He pay for the use of women's bodies. Now, even if this was his go-to coping strategy when he wasn't feeling too good, it was a pretty well-entrenched one at that point. And I think that what was also well entrenched was some negative attitudes about the escorts that he paid, paid by the hour, in order to make himself feel that bit better. By the time detectives interviewed Nassim again, the day after Christina's body was discovered, the post-mortem results were in. Okay. She'd been strangled with bare hands and bludgeoned 13 times with the kitchen pestle. Just to take that in, there's 13 blows God, to the head. Stress. What do you have to say about that? I think I'm just shocked. That's what I've got to say about it. So he, he tells us he's shocked. And he, also, he uses the voice of incredulity at that point. To, That's what I've got to say about. But it's an odd thing to say back. Why don't you just say, I'm, I'm just shocked. I can't explain this. I, I don't know what to say. I'm at a loss like you are. But he's, he's with it enough to be able to repeat back the police officer's own words. That's what I've got to say about it. And at this point, we get another very long pause of eight seconds. The most, it, the, like, these are sad stories. The loss of life is always said, RIP to all the victims. But the most interesting part about this documentary is, I've never seen a documentary like this in my life before with, with um, the forensic person, with the, with the, the language, the linguistics professor, then the body language, that, that, this is, this is crazy. Can you tell us how she came to suffer those injuries? No, I just don't know. That's why I'm shocked. So that was a, a short response, not many words, but there's so much going on there. We've got an eye closure here for the best part of two seconds. And this is a blocking tactic. Uh, when you're saying something you don't believe or you're uncomfortable with, you might close your eyes to distance yourself from that statement. Once he's made the statement, we then get a series of rapid blinks, which you're seeing here now. He blinks about five times, mm. which is far more than we need to just lubricate the eyes. So this is an indication of cognitive load or thinking hard. No, I just don't know. That's why I'm shocked. The claim that he doesn't know is being contradicted by a single-sided shoulder shrug. So this is subconscious, it's not intended for you to see. Also, we get a head shake no happening simultaneously. His, his head is in his hands. Well, you, what this is all telling me is he's never been in a lick of trouble before. He's never had to, <laughs> never been in the room with the police. He's never had to be cunning and outsmart anybody. It's never had to do it. But if you look closely at the two... You know, law-abiding citizens up until today and all his little escapades... ...of his nose, his head is moving back and forward, which, if it was vertical, would be a no gesture. So we've got eye closures. We've got leakage uh, contradicting his affirmative messages that he's no idea what happened in that room. And we've got the head shake nose, which stack up to tell us that he, he's very clear what happened in that room and he's lying to us. Nassim may have claimed his memory before the murder was a blank, but what he did immediately afterwards was a matter of record. Analysis of his mobile phone showed he'd sent a series of texts and that he was fully conscious and in control of his actions. The text messages, uh, particularly the message sent to his wife, uh, regarding him thinking um, it, it's all too late, uh, it's all gone wrong. To me, uh, as a lawyer, indicate that he knew exactly what he'd done. It was good evidence to show that he knew what had happened and he was choosing not to tell the police his involvement. But far from feeling guilty or remorse over what he'd done, Nassim then reverted to familiar behavior. 
while Christina's dead, he's surfing adult websites, looking for the next woman that he can buy. And he's been sending pornographic images of himself to escorts that he knows. The reason he's doing this is because he doesn't want to face up to what he's done. He's not ready to think about that. He wants to escape into this very familiar world of fantasy. So let's just say that he's not ready to think with his brain. He wants to think with another part of his body. It's an avoidance strategy. I mean, you've told Mike and I that nobody else entered the flat. The door was double locked. Both of these stories is wild. <laughs> wild. With the key left inside. Mm. So that leaves you, Said. It's not me. I'm not that person. What we see here is a, a first attempt at sadness. Um, when the brows raise and the mouth arches, it creates a, a, a signal of sadness. And when we feel it, uh, that's what happens. But when you want to pose sadness, you can create the same arch and pretend you're sad to get pity and try and get some mercy when you're in the wrong um, by jutting your chin and pursing out your lip. So if you ask a child to pose sadness, uh, we call this a sulk, they'll often go like this. And this is what he's doing. He's put a sulk pose on his mouth. If you look closely at the chin boss raising and his lip pouting out with his a little frown. So this combination is what we call pose sadness or sulking. It's not going to convince anyone uh, to have pity at this. Nah, you're pushing 60. We don't want to see you pout, dude. Just take, just, you committed a crime due to time. Point. Why didn't you even think about trying to get her help? Why didn't you even think about trying to call an ambulance for her? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do I wish it was Thursday afternoon again? Yes, I wish it was Thursday afternoon again. Do I wish I'd never, I'd never come to, to her flat? Yes, I do. I can't turn the clock back, I can't change things. But do I wish any of this outcome? No. It's, it's, well, it's two lives ruined, and many others as well, probably. This is a very self-centred individual. And at the end of this, the rationale he's got to is that it's ruined two lives. Now, who are those two lives that have been ruined? One is yeah. definitely the woman who's now deceased. The other you, one, given the focus has been on himself throughout much of this, he's him. The person he's concerned about ruining their life is himself. And I think that's why we get the added information and many others as well, properly. And many others as well, probably. Because he's probably thinking about what he's saying at this point and thinking this isn't coming across well, even if it's true. Even if he feels that way, he doesn't want to be perceived as so self-focused that he's actually worried about what this is going to do to the rest of his life. Two days after arresting Nassim, police charged him with murder. No. By the time the case reached court in December 2018, he changed his story. To what? He did remember attacking Christina but claimed it was in self-defense during an alcohol and drug-fueled fight. Zahid Nassim was body mapped for any injuries when he came into custody. And what he's telling is that he had no injuries. He claimed that the injuries that he inflicted uh, were because he was in fear for his own life and were proportionate and necessary to protect himself. It's difficult to understand how 13 blows of such severity. He was a bad liar with no lawyer and an even worse liar with a lawyer, like a solicitor. Verity could ever be warranted. The jury rejected Nassim's story and his not guilty plea. Yeah. Jailing him for life with a minimum of 19 years the judge said he'd launched an attack of extraordinary ferocity, subjecting Christina to unimaginable terror. Christina hasn't got a voice in all of this. 
and she is the only person that I would trust to give me an accurate account of whatever went on. My best guess would be that she said something, or she did something, or maybe she didn't want to do something. That made him unhappy. And in that moment, I think that she became the focus for an expression of his anger towards escorts in general, maybe, women in his life, or just the general dissatisfaction and emptiness at him. Or just being mad that he's a trick. Like, like, what are you... His life. This is somebody whose go-to coping strategy is to run away and escape but he's been sentenced to 19 years in jail, and that's not something that he's gonna be able to avoid. Never, you're in there, buddy. That's it? TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, man. Let me know what y'all think, man. Two terribly li terrible liars, I'm gone.